this year we have got 13 undergraduate students drawn from eight different U.S. universities who are currently being hosted at Egerton University for a period of eight weeks. Now this program is designed that each student will be assigned or attached to a host professor in a particular in, a, in the department of uh, in the faculty of agriculture or in the faculty of science. Now each mentor professor is allowed to host one to two students and each student has to undergo and carry out an independent uh, study which starts with the development of a research proposal uh, de developing the proposal to the extent of uh, executing the proposal and collecting primary data and analyzing the data to generate outputs which are publishable outputs. The goal of this uh, project is to give our students an experience that will train them to become global scientists and also to create uh, a research uh, experience in their, in their, give them research experience that will help them to identify themselves as uh, research scientists. So those are our two main objectives and for their research experience we are focusing on the forgotten food crops of Kenya with the overall goal to increase the food security in Kenya. Some of these um, forgotten uh, food crops have got great potential to address the food security issues that we are facing currently due to climate change and uh, we have also less land to produce enough food to feed the so many people that we must feed. I'm told that by 1950, by 2050, we will be having uh, more than uh, 9.5 billion people to feed. And uh, with less land, less water, which are some of the uh, results of um, uh, climate change, we are uh, uh, contributing to address some of these problems. I am from Fort Valley State University in America. Um, it's in Georgia. We are currently at Egerton University of Kenya and we are working on different research projects. We are here from a global REU experience hosted by Bowie State University of Maryland. My project is assessing the growth performance of African catfish cultured in the affordable domestic fish farming technology. And with this project, we have hopes of having this technology behind me in at least 5 million homes across Kenya in order to help combat food insecurity because research has shown as people's socioeconomic status decrease, their access to certain proteins such as beef, chicken, and goat decreases as well. So in order to make up for that nutritional gap, fish becomes even more important. So with this, we hope to have it across 5 million homes, at least in Kenya, to help combat that. And um, also they are able to sell the ones that they would not like to eat. So with them being able to sell, it also, um, it goes towards their living expenses as well as their children's educations and their day-to-day -day lives. We have research to support that. So, um, so far the journey has been, um, we came here, they already had the tank set up. Um, there were tilapia in it, so they know that it was viable for growing fish. Um, and on one of the, I believe, second weeks, we went to a local aquaculture pond that was already established and we got what's called fingerlings. Fingerlings are the smallest form of the African catfish, which are the ones that we are growing here. So we then brought those um, catfish from the farmer. We brought them here um, and we weighed and we measured them. After that, we took them and we put them inside of this tank and we have been weighing and measuring their growth ever since, as well as curating the perfect feeding schedule because if it's too cold, you can't feed. If it's too early in the morning or too late at night, you can't feed, they won't eat. And if you do feed, it will stress them out and they'll die. So this process so far has been mostly just learning 
what works for them and what doesn't, as well as how to fit um, that many fish into one while also keeping most of them alive. So, so far the process has been pretty simple, but um, some challenges that we have encountered is the um, dissolved oxygen content, content in the tank being too low, which results in the fish dying of suffocation. And so we have been working on methods to improve that, improve that one challenge. The overall project goal is to contribute to increased crop production in Dolicos, which is a lost crop in Kenya. Um, it used to be grown a lot, um, but after British colonization, it kind of, um, its popularity fell, uh, but there's renewed interest in it due to its high drought tolerance, um, adaptive growth, um, and its nutritious properties. So my first objective for this project is to identify the endophytes present in Dolicos, and my second objective is to determine the effect of endophytes on plant growth promotion. So for objective one, I was able to isolate 29 bacteria and 19 fungi. Um, and with those isolates, we were able to conduct gram staining um, on them to determine if they're gram positive or gram negative. Um, we are about to do the lactophenol cotton blue staining, which is for the fungi to um, observe the spore morphology of the fungi that we isolated. Um, and in terms of objective two, to determine the effect of the endophytes on plant growth promotion, um, we've been cultivating or incubating them on Jensen's media and Peak of Sky's media. So the first one is to determine the nitrogen fixing ability of the bacterial isolates and the second one, Peak of Sky's media, uh, that one is to determine the phosphate solubilization ability of bacteria and fungi. And for the Jensen's media, we have results already. Um, all of the root bacteria in Dolicos is able to fix nitrogen and um, actually in the root that is where the majority of the nitrogen fixing bacteria are. As for the Picovskaya's media and the phosphate solubilization of the bacterial and fungal isolates, um, that will be done in the coming weeks and then we'll be able to determine which, ones, which one of our isolates are able to um, solubilize phosphate. So my objectives for this project were to contribute to enhanced food security through um, bean production in Kenya, since beans are a very important source and affordable source of nutrition um, for a lot of low income countries. Um, and in order to do that, I have been looking at the optimal amount of foliar nitrogen, which is the fertilizer that I'm using on my bean plants. Um, and in order to do that, I'm looking at the effect of foliar nitrogen on the uh, nodulation of the bean plants and the yield performance. So we found with variety chalolang that a lot of the bean plants were um, produced a higher grain yield and higher nodulation at a lower level of nitrogen, whereas in variety rarimu, the plant performed better with at a higher level of nitrogen, which may conclude to the fact that the rhizobia in the chelolang root nodules are just more effective at fixing nitrogen. Therefore, they can um, use a lower level of nitrogen, which is therefore less expensive for farmers. Whereas by Rimu, maybe they aren't quite as effective at fixing nitrogen, so they perform better when there's more um, fertilizer. Um, which is a little less effective. Therefore, my recommendation for farmers would be use variety chalolang over variety rimu since it requires less fertilizer and um, uh, will produce a higher grain yield. Uh, work has been done previously to show that uh, though, though beans are nitrogen fixed in um, legumes, that uh, they need some starter nitrogen for them to perform well. So that's why we're testing the foliar nitrogen. And um, she was able to find out that the two bean varieties responded differently to foliar fertilizer. Uh, and uh, Chelalang uh, responded uh, better in that with only half the recommended rate of foliar nitrogen, 
we were still able to get high yields and it nodulated very well. But with Wairimo, a variety Wairimo, we needed a little more the recommended rate or at least double the recommended rate eh, to have uh, maximum yield and to also have nodulation. So it was just interesting just being able to look for how to assess the two varieties. I uh, would like to see this going into the future. How do we look at the economic um, aspects associated with using you know, nitrogen for beans and also possibly test with other varieties? And while in Kenya, I've been studying uh, sorghum and cold temperatures. So basically the whole journey was, we started off in a greenhouse where we had, we had planted the plants. We had like 10 different genotypes. Five were cold sensitive and five were cold tolerant. So basically what we did was we randomized and we replicated. We had uh, three replications and Basically, we planted like um, in the, the planting process was like we had like 16 plants in every pot. And after that, we watched them grow for like a week or two. And then after that, we transferred them to grow chambers. In the grow chambers, we used two of the replications. So in two of the replications, we put one in a hot temperature. For the hot temperature, uh, the minimum was 20 degrees Celsius. And then the, the maximum was 28 degrees Celsius. And then we put the other one in the cold temperatures. And in the cold temperatures, the highest was 20 degrees and the lowest was 10 degrees. So basically we left them in the grow chambers, watering them, um, eventfully and after that we took them out we had to do lipid analysis so we used the soxate method with hexane to extract lipids because you know a lipid is uh non-polar so we use hexane which is non-polar to to extract the lipid in 2019 i actually mentored two students uh, and we managed to do some work on finger millet nutrition agronomy and some bit of analyzing the nutritive value of finger millet. Because finger millet is an important crop for the dry land areas of Kenya and also the mid altitude areas. One of the most nutritive crops that have not been well recited because it is one of the traditional African crops. And here in Kenya, studying uh, finger millet, uh, also known as Wimby, uh, it's a very interesting crop. It's got a lot of nutritional value in it but it's also fallen by the wayside in terms of production from local farmers and wild scale production across the country of Kenya. So the basis of our project is to look at how we can combat food insecurity. And so with this particular cereal crop that we have, it has a lot of good things going for it. We wanted to see if we can enhance the germination rates by using different kinds of hormone therapies. So my title of my project is analysis of uh, hormone therapies and nitrogen fertilization on finger millets and the formulation of baby food formulas using legume bases. All that is to say that we took these petri dishes here, we put three different varieties of finger millet on them, and then we put different molarities or concentrations of plant hormones. So you have gibberellic acid, indole acetic acid, and benzoaminopurine. So we took these different plant hormones that we know help plants grow put them on there in different amounts and see how much they're germinating in addition to how much hormones they're actually picking up by their mass. Um, the next phase of our project is actually way over there in field seven to where we're doing nitrogen fertilization um, experiments where we planted these big pipes filled with 10 finger millet seeds. And in there, we're gonna be adding a nitrogen fertilizer to see what the effect of additional concentrations of nitrogen will have on the chlorophyll output of these plants. Nitrogen is critical to chlorophyll production on plants. So we're trying to see if we can increase that and make the finger millet even more viable. And the third thing that we were doing is we've been making a baby food formula or uji out of finger millet uh, the seeds. So we gathered three uh, different varieties and we've been adding different types of legumes. So for my project, the two legumes I'm adding are pigeon pea and, uh, and uh, peanut. 
So we grinded those up, we milled them, we mixed them together with the finger millet, and then we've been testing them on different nutritional bases, including protein content, magnesium, iron, calcium, ash content, moisture. So just the type, the typical things you would see on the back of a food uh, container for something like baby formula. We've been testing those to see if we can increase the amount of the available protein. And we targeted protein in particular because unfortunately finger millet is lacking in protein. It's great in carbohydrates, great in fibers, it's great in a lot of things, but protein is where it's lacking. Now we've actually finished our results recently and we found out that there's actually no significant statistical difference between the finger millet that was made with the legume bases and the one that was made without the legume bases. So while it was disheartening to see that we weren't able to increase the actual content of protein in a significant way, that kind of gives us more insight into the future when it comes to how we're going to approach additional tests. When it comes to the germination rate, we saw that actually the GA, uh, the gibberellic acid, actually has a pronounced effect on the germination rates. They had a higher overall germination average by just a bit, and it actually was more prominent when it came to the quickness it took to reach its maximum germination number over the last 21 days that we've been recording data. Um, in addition, we found that the of the varieties, the ED or the early duration, which is uh, still under testing and trials, is actually the best growing finger millet that we have, which gives a lot of hope for the future when it finally makes it through all its trials and it comes out in the market it'll be a very competitive uh, variety of finger millet, which will help hopefully get our local farmers and share uh, stakeholders to invest more into growing finger millet and exporting it out. This will help combat food uh, insecurity, but also be a great uh, financial boost to those people who need to move on from crops like corn and sugarcane that take too long to grow, the value of it's going down, it's too intensive to start up, we can show them things like finger millet or sorghum or any of the number of different uh, plants that our entire REU is looking at. And I was working on the constraints of finger millet production and innovation to its nutrients element. So the first experiment I did was try to was to figure out the effect of pH on the finger millet germination, as you can see here. So basically, I used 0.5 moles of hydrochloric acid and one mole of hydrochloric acid as two of my six solutions, and the other four included 0.5 moles of sodium hydroxide and one mole of sodium hydroxide. And then the control was to use the tap water, which also known as no treatment. And additionally to that, I also used distilled water as my solutions. So as the, as the experiment proceeded, we found out that the um, fringy millet germination actually responded best to control, which was the no treatment tap water. And there was no germination from the NaOH or the HCO for either the 0.5 moles or one mole of it. And the distilled water showed some signs of germination, but overall the, the control, which was the tap water, showed the best signs of germination as it showed upwards of 80%, while the control showed 40 to 60% germination rates. And the acidity, acidity and the alkaline um, treatments actually showed no germination at all. The second experiment while in Kenya was to formulate a, a baby Form a baby formula biofortified with legume sources such as chickpeas and cowpeas in order to increase its nutri nutritional content, ex focusing on the protein content especially. Um, after biofortifying it with a ratio of 71 to 29 percent, we actually discovered that it showed no improvement in its protein value and also. We had a different sample of baby formula, which was malted in order to also increase the germination rate because there were studies showed that when you increase the germination of the of the seeds before it is grinded into a flour, it will increase its protein content. But after running several tests, it also showed that malting did not increase the protein content. Overall, we've seen very great data from these students. They were very enthusiastic. They have done land analytical um, work. They've learned research work. They have learned publication, and they have generated reasonable data showing different impacts of uh, the different components of their study. So while here in Kenya, I'm working on cassava leaf as vegetable. So the goal of my project is to determine the nutrient and anti-nutrient of cassava leaves. So throughout this process, we were able to collect sample from the... So after collecting our sample from uh, Miguru County, we then took it back to uh, the biochemical 
biochemical lab here at Egerton University uh, where we were able to store them in some cooler to keep them fresh and then we directly started our process after 24 hours so we can have a good result. So we were able to identify the phytate, uh, the cyanide, the protein and the fiber which are anti-nutrient and nutrient of uh, cassava, some of the anti-nutrient and nutrient of cassava leaves. So the process took us about uh, three weeks because at the very beginning we had a challenge of getting all our samples together but we were still able to manage to get everything together. Um, the whole experience was amazing. We had a chance to visit uh, different different stations where we were able to uh, educate the farmer about about different products that we can have out, uh, out of cassava root and cassava leaves. So. I would also want to bring to the attention of the global community that this particular program was able to actually allow the students interact with the different cultural uh, cultures that we have in Kenya and at the same time interact with, this, uh, with the societies at the level of collecting and generating information that is useful for augmenting the works that they were doing. So basically the students successfully uh, stayed at Egerton University for eight weeks. They were able to make presentations and some of those presentations, I, I believe, have met the threshold of being published in quality scientific journals. I would welcome the community to be ready to support such a program. And next year, when we'll be hosting the third cohort, we'll be ready to host a bigger uh, number of students from different U.S. universities.